Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another webinar from the Antarctic, Imagine Antarctica series. We are going to wait until 3 p.m. for everyone to join. So in the meantime, go ahead and grab a glass of water, juice, or whatever you need to feel comfortable and sit down with us for today's webinar. Today we're, we'll be broadcasting from both uh, Santiago, Chile and Indianapolis. So uh, <laughs> it's 3 p.m. here, it's 2 p.m. Uh, in Indianapolis. That's right, Michael? That's right. So did the, the time just change yesterday? Yeah, or a couple? the time, yeah. Yeah. The time <laughs> so changed uh, here over the weekend, so it's always good to, to take that into consideration. Oh, and people are starting to join. We have 19 people with, uh, with us already. So people Excellent. were already waiting and going up. Perfect. It would be great to know where everyone is joining uh, from today. So if you could, would go ahead and write on the chat window where you're joining us from, that would be very cool. We had over 100 people registered for today's webinar, so hopefully everyone would be able to join. And if not, we'll send the recorded webcast afterwards. We have Mark Sukowski joining us from Sonoma in California. That's one country, if I'm not wrong, right? <laughs> Beautiful. Hello, Mark. We have Mike from Salt Lake City in Utah. That's awesome. Excellent people, <laughs> a lot of people from the States. We, do, we normally have a lot of people joining us from the States to these webinars. I mean, it's very international, but people from the States are always part of the majority of our audience when we do these things. It's very good. I've been seeing some pictures coming in from California with all the smoke. Oh, the fires, <laughs> exactly. I almost forgot it was that time of the year again. Uh, you know, during September, October, with the Santana winds, I guess it makes it more prone for, for fires over there. So, so it's yeah. a, really, a really shame. And hopefully everyone's staying safe. So just for the people joining us, uh, we're going to be going starting at 3 p.m. We're just waiting for everyone to, to join and, and, and get settled before we, we do start. So you still have a couple minutes before we, we start. So go ahead and grab that coffee, <laughs> grab that glass of water, and sit down. We have 32 people right now joining us. Excellent. That's good. Going up. Hopefully everyone's admiring my office background. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you do have a good story back there. And yes, sure people will appreciate true. later on in the presentation when you mention that. <laughs> Everything behind me has a little story. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all very intentional. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had time to, to decorate this space that I'm using um, you know, to work for the time being. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should bring it to life for sure. <laughs> All right, and we have one more minute before we start. We have almost 40 persons joining right now. All right, and it's 3 p.m. So I say, let's start. What do you say, Michael? Sounds good. All right then. Hello everyone and welcome to yet another webinar from the Imagine Antarctica series. Today, today's webinar is called A Journey to Antarctic Photography. And well, thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Renato Marin and I am the Market Engagement Manager here at Antarctica 21. And also today with us we have 
professional videographer and photographer Michael Durr. He will take us through his first experience in Antarctica and answer all your questions photography related. So before we start, I want to go through some cells, through some housekeeping rules uh, very fast. Today's webinar will be recorded and sent to everyone who registered but couldn't make it today to today's webinar, so don't worry about that. And questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. So there's a Q&A box uh, right down there to the right, so please make sure to send them through there. Also today, we'll, we'll be giving away a $50 gift certificate from Amazon to help you prepare for your Antarctic experience. Mm -hmm. All right then, without further ado, I'll let Michael introduce himself. So please go ahead, Michael. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Welcome. I'm very happy to be part of this webinar and excited to share my, my inaugural trip story with you guys. Um, we'll kind of jump into my presentation here and um, I'll click that through. Just a very quick introduction. Uh, again, my name is Michael Durr. Uh, I'm a video producer with a, a website, photopxl.com. Uh, I've worked with them for the past few years. Uh, Kevin Raber is the guy who runs that website. Uh, I am at Instadur on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, I use Instagram primarily. So if there's anything that you see uh, or hear during this presentation and you have questions or anything like that, Instagram is probably the best place to reach out to me. Uh, also, my website has all my contact information, email address, and things like that. So I just wanted to quickly give you guys that so, so that you have it. Okay. And um, thanks, Michael, for that. And I think the best way, um, you know, to start this topic is by you telling us how you prepare for a trip to Antarctica, photography wise, of, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> so very quickly, uh, I, I might reference a video that I created a few times throughout the presentation. And that video lives uh, on the PhotoPXL website um, and also on the, the YouTube channel, which is uh, youtube.com slash PhotoPXL. So we'll be sure to send out a link to that video as well so that uh, you can see some of the things that I'm referencing uh, throughout my presentation. But let's jump right into the trip preparation. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, my, my kids wanted to come with me, but they, they were past the weight limit. So <laughs> my, uh, my trip was in February, uh, and you can see that my, my oldest son is still wearing his Grinch uh, pajamas. So that, that gives you a little bit of sense of the, the couple months of Christmas that we had there. <laughs> that would be 44 pounds over, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, very quick overview. Uh, I'm sure many of you are interested in the types of clothing and things that I wore outside of my photography gear, which we'll get to. Uh, but this kind of gives you a good sense of it. This is me trying on all my stuff for the very first time. Uh, have hats, sunglasses, uh, you know, an outer proof, waterproof outer layer jacket. Um, you know, many layers is what you what you want to do. So I have base layer, kind of a mid layer uh, for both my upper body and lower body but really recommend kind of spending some money on quality waterproof gear, such as uh, a jacket and pants. Uh, you certainly don't want to get wet because it'll get, it'll only make you colder if you get wet <laughs> and very uncomfortable. So uh, exactly. I did this, this stuff important. that I've had kept me very dry throughout. Uh, I also had a few pairs of socks, some nice warm gloves. Uh, I had a waterproof pair of gloves and then kind of that screen friendly glove uh, was was very warm but also allowed me to uh, very easily use my camera and use my touch screen on my phone and things like that those uh, are definitely a must must bring for everyone's interested in photography for sure it, it'll make you much more comfortable and be able to to manage your camera you don't want to be taking off your gloves during even if it's just your phone actually that's true that's very true uh, as far as gear goes uh, I brought too much stuff. <laughs> I can see that, yeah. This, this kind of gives you an overview of the things that I brought with me. Now, not every single thing here actually made it on the boat with me. I left a few things at the hotel. This was kind of due to weight and just kind of some of the discussions I've had uh, leading up to the, uh, the actual trip. Now, keep in mind, I also was doing, I was doing stills and video. So I do have two, two camera bodies. Uh, I had a Canon uh, 5D Mark IV that I was using for my stills and a Sony a7 III that I use primarily uh, for video capture. I also had kind of some small cameras, uh, 
it's kind of the benefit of some of the modern cameras these days, things like GoPros, Insta360, uh, had a waterproof Olympus camera, things like that. I was able to kind of, you know, keep in a pocket, uh, almost use it as a backup, you know, very easily to pull out and capture some things with that as well. But this kind of gives you a sense of the type, type of gear that I brought with. Um, one thing I'll say from a photography standpoint, it is a good idea to have two camera bodies if you're able to have two camera bodies. Um, that will allow you to keep kind of a wider lens, like I would suggest a 24 to 70, um, and then a longer lens, you know, a 70 to 200 or a 100 to 400. Um, that way you don't have to switch lenses in the field, which can become kind of cumbersome and you, you know, it's kind of wet and misty and dusty. So you don't want to be uh, exposing your sensor when you're, when you're out in the field. So that gives us kind of a sense of the gear that I had. Yeah. That's some really good advice for every, you know, photography enthusiast. And well, let's just jump into your experience in Antarctica then. Absolutely. So a lot of people have asked me, you know, what's the trip like? How did you get there? <laughs> um, so I took a, a, a plane ride from Indianapolis to Miami, uh, from Miami to Santiago, which was kind of that long leg of the trip. Um, and then Santiago to Punta Arenas and Punta Arenas to Antarctica. Uh, there are trips that, that will sail from uh, Punta Arenas to Antarctica and across the Drake. I got off easy and was able to fly. <laughs> and uh, as far as my experience in Antarctica, I'll kind of jump in. This is the kind of high end or high perspective view of the of the trip that exactly. we took. So flying across the Drake from Punta Arenas, getting on the boat at Frey Station, kind of circling around that peninsula area, and then taking off again from Frey Station and heading back to Punta Arenas. That's um, this kind of gives you a zoomed in view of that peninsula. These are the stops that we, we made on our trip. Uh, now, not every trip will go to the exact same spots because um, you know, the, this, the trip is geared to give you the best possible experience. So you're, a lot depends on weather, uh, potentially some you know, where wildlife is more active, things like that. Um, but just so you're, you're aware, these are the, the spots that I, I visited. As far as uh, the plane ride into Frey Station from Punta Arenas, I know that I was surprised how nice the plane was. <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting. I guess maybe I was in my head. I was thinking I'd be in one of those kind of like cargo planes, like zip. <laughs> been a bit more adventurous. Yeah, exactly. But I I'll tell you, it was a super nice plane, a super nice experience. They, they even had a, uh, a meal on the plane for us, uh, which again, I was super surprised at how nice everything was. And then um, very comfortable flight. Uh, it was, I'll, I'll admit it's a little nerve wracking when you come and you're about to land on this gravel road, this short runway. Um, you can actually see it in the picture here. This plane is designed to land on short runways. Um, and of course, you know, safety is always first. So um, they make sure that they're keeping track of weather and everything like that to ensure that you are uh, landing safely. And, and the landing and the flight and everything was, was extremely smooth for us. Um, just to give you a sense, I know I mentioned part of the reason I was on this, this trip was uh, with, with a photo PXL and Rockhopper workshop. Uh, now, Rockhopper Workshop is run by Kevin Raber, so if you see me there in the center, uh, he's just above me, and to the right is Art Wolf. The three of us were the instructors on this trip. So these are all our attendees on our workshop. So part of my job was to not only document the trip, but also help educate uh, on photography and video throughout the, throughout the trip. Now, the amount of people we have here, that's uh, about half of the people that were actually a part of the, the whole trip but I interacted primarily with, with these people. And uh, I will say that not everyone here is a professional photographer. So it technically was a photography workshop, but a lot of people, you know, the, the husband, the wife, um, or maybe a friend, you know, is kind of the, the active shooter kind of thing and where they're primarily the, you know, professional photographer wanting to learn most. And the other person is there more of like a support person. Uh, just to kind of be along for the trip and enjoy everything. So we kind of, kind of had, uh, you know, help, help those people as well, as far as, you know, just shooting with their cell phones or, um, you know, small cameras that they had brought. 
So it was kind of fun. It, it ran the whole gamut of, of, of how many, uh, or how diverse the, uh, the shooting was on the trip. So. I guess it was just a perfect excuse to go to Antarctica. And take oh yeah, Antarctica. exactly. <laughs> Why not? Um, this is a, a good example. We, we landed uh, at Frey Station here, and uh, I, I got a kick out of this this pillar, all of the arrows pointing pointing north. Um, just kind of a cool moment. I actually kept my iPhone in my top jacket chest pocket, so I was able to kind of you know just take quick little photos like this, or I may may not have needed my my big camera, but just kind of wanted to document something. And, uh, it was very easy access and it was, it was easy to do so. Um, I will say if you look in the distance on this picture, just under the, the red sign there, you see the boat. <laughs> Magellan, that's true. Yeah. So it, it was uh, uh, quite a hike, I would say, from the plane to the shore, uh, roughly a mile uh, walk. And it is it was cold and windy, as you would expect. Um, but as far as like being out in the elements, like this was the hardest part of the whole trip because the whole trip is designed to take you where the weather is calmer and um, maybe not as, as fierce. Um, you know, that being said, it, you know, it, the weather is unpredictable, but um, as, as long as you get to the ship and once you're on the ship, everything kind of uh, becomes a little bit easier. <laughs> this was uh, the ship that I was on, the Magellan Explorer. Uh, an absolutely incredible ship. It was uh, relatively new for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, it felt like a, like a better than most hotels that I've been to. <laughs> uh, the food was incredible, yeah. the, just the rooms, everything, accommodations were, were first class. Um, and it was uh, just a, an incredible ride for sure. Uh, here's a shot of, of the boat just in the bay. I come from a marketing background. I, I worked at a lot of marketing agencies in the Chicagoland area. So I, I actually really enjoyed trying to get cool shots of the ship in, in its element. <laughs> That's quite the picture. Yeah, exactly. I, I got a few of them along the way. So this is one of my favorite ones. So. so I'm guessing one of the biggest focus of uh, photography wise was landscapes, right? And well, besides you know, the shape of the bridge right here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from from a perspective of you could shoot anything in any direction here, uh, it's such an immersive uh, place. Um, the boat itself was just incredible, as I was saying, and what I was really surprised by was the access to the bridge. Uh, you could, could come visit the captain as, as he was steering the ship. They, they had like a color-coded, um, you know, I think it was just a piece of paper or a light on the door. Uh, if it was green, you could enter. If it was red, uh, you know, that, that means you, you obviously couldn't. But for the most part, I don't think I ever walked up there and was and saw it red. So it was very accessible. Uh, this shot here is actually a pano shot from my iPhone. And uh, just wanted to kind of show that whole, that whole uh, bridge area. Yeah. And again, there, that, that's a shot of the captain. Again, an iPhone shot. And I used an app uh, called Tintype. Uh, that's actually what I captured all of the attendees' images with. Uh, it kind of wanted that, you know, explorer look. Has kind of had that old school, you know, uh, yeah, those were pretty cool vibe to it. So I made sure that I captured everyone, and I just used my phone for that. So it was a, a great supplement to some of the, you know, other shots that I've got. Uh, this was my first landing uh, on the Antarctic con Antarctica continent. Um, it was really quite amazing. Uh, There's a lot of penguins at this, uh, Gen 2 penguins when we first got off on land and just to actually be on land after after all the, the journey to get to that point was was quite the experience. You can see I have my dual gloves going there. So I have the, the black one, which is waterproof. And then the other one, which is my, my shooting hand I had ready uh, with that kind of warmer touch sensitive uh, glove, which worked out really well. Looks kind of silly, but it worked out. <laughs> uh, this is a, a quick shot of Kevin and I. Um, Kevin actually got married in Antarctica, and we touch on a little bit of that in that video that I mentioned, but this was in Nico Harbor, and what I used to capture this image was one of those 360 cameras. Um, so if, again, I, I won't go into too much detail on those types of cameras, but if you do have questions on them, uh, certainly reach out to me. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to go into more depth on those. So.
but yeah, like we can jump right into landscape. Um, I was very excited uh, about the icebergs. Um, I like water, I like ice, I like the cold. So to, to see something like this <laughs> uh, in person was, it still even today kind of blows my mind. Like it was like a dream in some ways. Um, this is a, what they call a tabular iceberg, which is a giant piece of ice that kind of has broken free of the larger ice sheets. Uh, so I, I wish I had something to kind of tell me how big <laughs> this piece of ice actually is. Um, you know, even to know like how long it was, I mean, it's hard to, for me to even estimate, but let alone how deep it goes, how much it weighs, how much fresh water is there. But just to give you a sense of kind of zooming in on this uh, tabular iceberg, uh, this is when we got off on the Zodiacs from the main ship and we kind of cruised up as close as we could get <laughs> to safely to the, uh, to the edge of the tabular icebergs here, which felt like we were right on top of it. Um, and this kind of gives you that, again, if you kind of look here, another zoomed in view, kind of straight on, you can see how that piece is almost, it is basically disconnected from the, the, the main uh, ice sheet there. So you know, at any given time, it, it could uh, it could and eventually will fall into the water. So you need to keep a safe distance. Uh, this is where I like to kind of mention the lens choices that I've had. I had a 24 to 70 for the most part, uh, as far as a wide angle goes, and then a 70 to 200. If I had to do it again, I would probably take a 100 to 400 instead of the 70 to 200. And I'll kind of show you some examples on why I say that. Uh, especially in the wildlife, but for the most part, 7200 is what I had on my camera for the most part uh, throughout the entire trip, and that's what this this image here was captured with. Now, that being said, this was a kind of a wider shot, so this was a 24 to 70. Mm -hmm. um, the color is not manipulated really at all. Actually, there's very little manipulation to any of my photos. Um, I try to keep it to as, as real of, of a view in my mind as, as it was. Um, this particular piece is, was really fascinating with the color and uh, just kind of that white, I believe it was snow that was kind of blowing up against there and kind of stuck, uh, just really, really amazing. And these icebergs, you know, you're able to, you know, get up pretty close to, so you're, and you also circle them and they're different from all sides. So it was really quite, quite the experience to see this up close. Uh, again, uh, mentioning this is Antarctica in general is a very dynamic landscape. So uh, you can see here, there's actually a big piece of, of ice falling uh, kind of midway through, just right kind of where that cane shape is in the water, uh, coming up from the water there. And you could see it kind of crash down. So uh, it, it worked out really well from a visual standpoint, the way that, that cane shape kind of arcs down and and then you see the splash and it's kind of highlighted by where that dark area is, that like inlet there, uh, which worked out really well photographically. <laughs> the other thing I was really fascinating about this type of, uh, of scene was just the sound it makes. Um, again, like you hear that, it's almost like your, your foot stepping into snow. It's like that crunching sound. Um, and now these icebergs are kind of, or this is glacier here, kind of, um, falling in on itself. So sometimes you just sit there quietly, you turn the, the uh, engine to the Zodiac off and listen and you just hear this kind of, it sounds like the, uh, the glacier's alive, just that kind of crunching noise. Nature at, at, at its best. It is, it was very incredible. <laughs> and again, getting back to that kind of zoomed in look of things, you know, this is just the iceberg reflecting uh, in the water. Now, I've never seen reflections quite like this before. <laughs> um, I, I joked with Kevin many times on the trip that we were going to run out of blue ink when we got back home. <laughs> Those blues are amazing in the pictures. Yeah, it's just, uh, and I like to shoot tighter. Um, so again, having that 100 to 400, so I could have gotten even tighter in some scenarios probably would have been pre preferable. Uh, but the 70 to 200 did work really well for me. Uh, in most most scenarios. And this gives you a little bit of perspective. Uh, it's one of the zodiacs there, uh, which is what I'm on as well. There's about 10 of us on each on each zodiac. 
And again, you kind of split up when you get off the boat, go into different, explore different areas. Um, part of that was, you know, me being an instructor, helping to kind of navigate what I saw and saw potential images and, and things like that, which was really fun. We did have a, uh, is different types of weather throughout the whole trip. Um, we didn't get a ton of like bright blue sunny days, but it was, you know, misty kind of gray. Um, and then this day was just incredible. We had this kind of <laughs> bright blue sky and which highlighted everything, you know, the water and these amazing clouds. I actually have to figure out what types of clouds those are because <laughs> I've shown, I've shown this images image to a number of people. Uh, this was just from the, the main deck of the boat. There was a, a handful of us out there shooting this, this scene. And it's again, a very dynamic landscape The everything's always moving. So everything's always changing. You can see there like the lower clouds and the tips of the, the mountain peaks, you know, everything is just constantly, um, you know, alive and moving. This is a uh, kind of the zoomed in look again that during that same day. And again, you can see here, I was probably zoomed in all the way in with my 70 to 200. If I was able to zoom in even tighter, you can see some of these textures on these icebergs in the foreground, or even, you know, maybe framing one of the mountains up in the background with those low clouds. So much you can do um, by, by kind of zooming in and looking deeper into the, into the image, rather than just kind of taking in that whole, whole incredible landscape. Uh, this, this for me is probably, I, I guess you'd say the highlight of the trip if there was one, if I had to pick one. <laughs> um, these are chinstrap penguins and just kind of living on this iceberg floating, floating in the water, which uh, was just incredible. Um, the boat actually had passed this and I, I think everyone kind of realized that this was a very iconic special moment. So the captain actually turned the boat around and ended up basically pulling up in front of this iceberg. So we were able to like hang out here for a little while, um, which was not something that we were really able to do for the most part, because we we're always moving through the water. Um, so it was very cool to, to kind of stand out here and, and take this moment in. And also we were pushing our cameras kind of to the, you know, their highest capabilities because it was uh, becoming night, getting darker and darker. Um, so this was, I think even shot at ISO 1600. Uh, maybe 3,200. So it kind of gives you a sense of having that uh, that ability to shoot in darker situations will will certainly help out. This is a little bit of a zoomed in view. There's also a great um, few video clips of this moment in that video I mentioned, which we'll be sure to be sure to share with you guys. But I thought this was funny because the the penguins had to wait for the wave to come and basically crash up against the iceberg so that they could get high enough to climb up. <laughs> So it's very interesting. They look and all like that struggling down there. Yeah. All that red as well as the uh, the excrement of the penguins, which <laughs> I didn't know at first glance, and quickly learned and made a lot of sense. But uh, was very visually, uh, very visually cool. This particular moment was one of my favorite shots of the trip as well, just because it was. I feel like I was the only one on the ship to get a, this shot. <laughs> Um, we were actually having like, I like to call it a tailgate. We were, you know, being from Chicago, kind of eating. We actually ate outside on the, the deck of the boat. It was actually during that sunny, that sunny day. And um, what we, what I ended up doing is I needed to run back to the, my cabin to grab something. And I came out of my room on the other side of the ship where I don't think many people were, if anyone. So I was walking outside and I looked back and as we're traveling, the sun kind of breaks through and lights up this uh, iceberg really kind of dark in the background and then uh, it was gone in an instant because not only are we moving but the sun was moving and the clouds were, were moving so this kind of it seemed to only happen for a couple seconds and that was gone <laughs> so yeah, I, I, showed, I, I showed a few pictures or a few people just on the back of my camera I was like hey check this out and they're like when did you get that shot how did you do <laughs> <laughs> but again it was very very uh there's no manipulation here. It just looked like that, which is incredible. Uh, again here, this was probably one of my favorite moments. I'll probably say that about every image, but <laughs> this image, uh, this next set of images kind of gives you a sense of that traveling through the water 
and anticipating your your photos. So I mean, the the scene was incredible with the way the sun was was hitting the water there and kind of breaking through the clouds. Um, you know, I saw this iceberg kind of coming as we were approaching it framed up the bigger one, the tabular in the background and kind of got this nice shot. Uh, and then as we're getting in closer, <laughs> so you know, we're approaching that, that one that was in the distance, this cloud, I don't even quite understand how <laughs> it was lit up like this. <laughs> um, Cause there was no light being like, sh like shown towards us. It was just like yeah. like spotlight almost as if you were to light it. Um, but just an incredible, incredible moment. And again, here getting closer still, I think the only thing I did to this image was I actually brightened up the, uh, the tabular iceberg a little bit, just to, so you could see some of that texture. Um, but everything else was just as I saw it pretty much. This is actually, actually, I think it was this previous one. Yeah, this one's my desktop background right now. <laughs> it's a good text though. Yeah. And this is a uh, deception Island, another kind of, uh, very different shooting scenario. Uh, the old whaling tanks are on this island, so you get a lot of rust. Uh, it's in a um, active volcano, um, so the the volcano heats up the basically the shore and the sand, and you get this crazy steam coming off. This was just a shot of one of the crew. I think they were setting out flags to, you know, where we were where we were to journey, not journey past, and things like that. So. But uh, this go. I, I want to try this in black and white. I think it would be more of a more of a good yeah. shot. <laughs> it's gonna be one of my favorites for sure. <laughs> that kind of brings us to wildlife. Um, exactly. Yeah, and those were some amazing landscape pictures. Uh, yes. So, what type of wildlife did you encounter down there? Oh, uh, there's all so many different kinds, um, and I'll kind of take you through. Again, I this is a fun shot. There's this kelp gull right in the center. Uh, this iceberg in the background. Um, I know this is kind of an interesting one when you talk about wildlife, but if you look down to the bottom left there, there's a couple of seals hanging out on the iceberg in the foreground. So this kind of gives you a sense of scale and and how uh, how big these icebergs were, but also how you know the life around them is interacting. Uh, we certainly got close uh, to to penguins for sure, and and. This was, I think, Brown Bluff, that first first uh, place that we, we were on land. Um, you know, the penguins are all around you. I think I had a 70 to 200 on at this point, so I was able to get in really, really tight on, on, some, of the, on some of the penguins. This guy with his little, you know, mullet, <laughs> mullet thing going on in the background. It, these guys really do have personalities. They're fun to watch, and, um, you know, they're always doing, like, goofy little little things, so it's fun to to capture for sure. These are my favorite of the penguins, the Adelis. I, I think it's their eyes that like really draw me in. You just got these deep blue eyes and then they kind of looks like almost like they have like a helmet on or something. Or a exactly. <laughs> uh, I, these are of the seals too. These are probably my favorite seals, the Weddells. They, they got the, you just want to kind of go up and like pat, pat them, you know? <laughs> and look like a lap. Yeah, little like puppy, puppy eyes. Yep. But yeah, these, yeah it was sure. so so cool to see th these guys up close. And what I, what I tended I tended to concentrate more on video when I was up towards mm -hmm. the wildlife to to get some of that action and some of the the movements uh, that course. you can't necessarily capture with a still image. So um, I had you know both cameras with me, and I was able to kind of capture video clips um, during these moments as well. That yeah, makes sense. This guy, a leopard seal, I, I think he's yawning or he's yelling at us to, to move along or something. But <laughs> it, he was uh, really cool, seemingly had some personality to yeah. him as well. Kind of a, just crazy moment to see all this wildlife in such a short Top, span of yeah. time. <laughs> Top predator of Antarctic waters, the leopard seal. Exactly. And then again, this was on Deception Island. So these were the, the old kind of degrading whale tanks. So you get like this kind of rusty backdrop and, and then you got the seal hanging out in there. And uh, again, like this, I, I, depending on the season that you are, are there on this trip, th this island could be covered in snow. Um, I think we just happened to be there at the warmer time of year. So a lot of the snow had melted off mm -hmm. and you just kind of are, are left with this like, 
vast uh, landscape, which was, mm -hmm. was pretty incredible and very different from everything that we had seen to that point. Yeah, it's a good contrast. This one, this moment I always get, you know, if there was one thing that I was like, oh, I wish I could do that again, it would be this moment. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, this was an evening Zodiac tour and it turned out that our group ended up staying back on the main ship because they weren't going to take everybody out. So it was kind of, I don't know if it was luck of the draw or what, but the other uh, half of the ship ended up going out um, on the Zodiacs but they got super close to the humpback whales that were actually feeding. So you can see they kind of trailed them and were able, I, I, if there's one shot I feel like I'm missing from Antarctica, it's that close up shot of the whale tail like coming out of the water. Um, again, like I was able to get pretty close just from the boat. This one just shows some perspective. And I also shot a lot of video at this time, which worked out really well. So um, you gotta I'm go not, back. I'm not, I'm not bitter about it at all. <laughs> but it was a, a very special moment for a lot of the people that were on the, on the boat at this time. And this is another good point to kind of explain the dynamic nature of Antarctica in general. Mm -hmm. Like everything that you see, um, you no one will ever see again because it's constantly changing, constantly moving. Uh, exactly. It's unlike any other place on the planet, really. Um, you know, there, there's not that iconic location where you're going to stick your tripod and get that shot. It's, it's just evolving and moving all the time. Um, so all the shots that anyone that gets after me will be very different from the ones that I've had. So it's kind of very, a cool, cool place to visit from a photographic standpoint. This again, the orcas, um, they're kind of down there on the bottom left. This, these are the moments that I kind of wish I had that longer lens so I could get a little tighter on on the orca swimming or potentially like the boat there in the background. That's one of the only other ships that we saw on the whole trip. Um, so it's kind of, you really feel uh, isolated and like a, in a, I know you're on a, an adventure for sure when you're out there. And just in case someone didn't catch that in the beginning when you mentioned it, uh, mm -hmm. you traveled in February, right? So Yes, that's right. You get less less snow, like let's say better weather, so to speak. Yeah, and also less ships around than sure. in, like the higher season of of the summer. Yeah. Now this brings us to the polar plunge. <laughs> you got to do it. Yeah, not everyone did it, but I highly recommend doing it. Um, it was probably one of my favorite moments of the whole trip. It was a little, I was a little anxious, of course, during it, but. I had myself covered. I had my GoPro in my hand. <laughs> I had uh, th that Sandra there, who was part of the, the, the expedition staff. She held my 360 camera for me. And then there's actually one of the crew members that's shooting photos of everybody that did this. And then I believe uh, Kevin actually captured this shot of me uh, from above. So I had like multiple cameras on me. And of course I, I edit a little video together of this moment, <laughs> but there's me kind of crashing into the water. <laughs> Pretty cool. It was it's a uh, pretty photograph moment. It was so, it was amazing. I, I love how this picture turned out, but you know, me being the video person, I still have that camera up and framed perfectly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thanks, so why, why will I go back to Antarctica? Well, why? This gives you, a, there's one thing I want to mention first about this, uh, this mm -hmm. shot. So I did bring a tripod. That's mainly because I thought I was going to need it for video, which I actually didn't even use it that much for video. Um, mm -hmm. But I did bring it with and I used it so sparingly. I wanted to kind of try to capture this sh shot of me like on the front of the ship uh, with kind of that night sky coming. You can see some stars coming in and whatnot. Um, but a lot of people, from a photographic standpoint have asked me about a tripod. And I always, I would still say I, I would leave it behind um, if I did it all again. One, cause it's just very cumbersome to carry around. And two, you're not in any one spot for long enough to, to set up the tripod. So if you set it up, the things that you're, you're probably trying to capture are already gone. <laughs> and for the most part, you're constantly moving anyways, whether you're on the big ship or a Zodiac uh, or even on land, you, you're typically walking a lot and wanting to see as much as possible. So having a tripod ends up becoming more of a, 
of a pain yeah, than, yeah. than anything else. And it's funny that you mentioned that because we do get uh, that question asked a lot by people interested in photography. So yeah, yeah, for there, sure. There you go. And I totally understand. I, I I thought the same thing and 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 whatnot. But the cameras these days are able to shoot so well without tripods that you'll get much more and you'll be much more comfortable if you're uh, if you don't have to worry about it. So. Exactly. So we're kind of on the the topic of why I would go back. <laughs> well, that there's that moment of there's very, I, I feel as if I went back again, I would be, I would be able to anticipate more like what I wanted to capture and, and actually take in the moments a little bit more than I felt like I did. Uh, there was, now I was also there as part of my job was to be capturing stuff. So, you know, I, I had to be doing that as well, but um, this, this moment of, it was actually with Kevin and I, we both walked around the ship at night. And so it's pitch black out. Uh, he always, he, he was mentioning to me how he likes to do kind of a, a night walk around the ship. And as we're walking around, we're just like outside, no one else was out there. We hear this humpback whale and it just, you know, you hear, you hear that like Oof, in the water and we look out and he like swam right up next to the ship. <laughs> so we spent like the whole day, like tr tr tracking down these guys, trying to get good images of them. <laughs> then we're outside by ourselves, no one around and comes right up to us. No camera rest. <laughs> that, that's wildlife there for you. <laughs> <laughs> but it really was because it was night. Like it was a great moment for me because I didn't have any cameras on me. I was just able to kind of take in that moment. And ironically, it's the one story that I probably talk about the most and mention the most. So um, I do recommend, you know, put the camera down occasionally and um, try to take in some of those moments for sure. Um, this is kind of a, a joke slide, but I like to take pictures of my food. <laughs> These are uh, just a few of the amazing meals that we had on the ship. And I just use my iPhone for these. Um, I, I, I made the reference earlier that my iPhone is kind of like, I look at it as like a supplement to my big camera. So main, in those capturing those moments of, you know, myself with some of the attendees or, you know, doing some selfies, things of that nature or shooting my food, uh, just fun things like that, that you don't want to bust out your big camera for. I'm not going to print this and put it on my wall, <laughs> but it's great for social media and, uh, you know, just kind of telling the full story of, of the journey, which was, which was really fun. The food was incredible, by the way. <laughs> the hospitality I experience and worry second to none. Yeah, I always wonder, like, where it all came from. Like, <laughs> all of a sudden, <laughs> there was these, like, plated dinners and just amazing lunches and breakfasts. It was really incredible. All the magic happening down there. Exactly. <laughs> if I went back, I would, I would try to get under there and, and see some of the workings of <laughs> Uh, this, I think I, one of the attendees took this of me, just, again, just with my iPhone. Uh, I didn't have, you know, a ton of pictures of myself from the trip. So this was one of those moments that was kind of special. I think this was during that little tailgate outside dinner that we were having. And um, you could see, like, I'm just wearing, like, kind of my mid-layer um, mm -hmm. North Face, you know, kind of hooded sweatshirt thing. And then I had a base layer on under that. So for me, I was totally comfortable. Now there were some people that were like from Florida and different parts of <laughs> South U United States that were cold, but you know, being me being from Chicago, I was used to that. So. And again, here, same thing. Uh, just kind of popped out my phone, got my feet in the foreground there with the big, the big uh, glacier in the background, and took a little selfie there too with the that tin type app. But just kind of a incredible moment. <laughs> I was by myself during this moment as well. So there was like nobody around me. That brings me to the story of a lifetime. So uh, this is a, actually, I just got this uh, recently. This is like a, a sample print, uh, a website called Our Trillion. Uh, I saw an ad for it on Instagram. And it, they basically take your image and they, they print text over so that mm -hmm. you, you obviously pick the text, but uh, these are all quotes from like the trip. So like people, I had interviewed a number of people on the trip and these are quotes from them. And then from some of the explorers as well. From, yeah, I see some Shackleton in there. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it's like this kind of this mix of things. And uh, I'm really excited to see what it looks like in print, but that was kind of a pretty.
pretty, looks pretty cool. Interesting. Yeah, looks really cool. And it's fun, a fun way to share the stories. I mean, this too, I did a, a video for Photo PXL on metal prints. You can actually see one of those prints uh, over behind me here on the wall. That's uh, the one. Yeah. That I, I, yeah. iconic moment of I had this printed on metal. It just looks incredible. Um, you know, printing these images are really what it's all about and sharing them with everybody. <laughs> Even me doing this webinar uh, is just a great way for me to kind of relive everything and share it with people. Uh, this is kind of a unique idea I had. We have a, a local like ice cream, like they do pop-up ice cream sales basically. So they make all the ice cream in their home and then, you know, they'll sell it at different locations around the city. So I kind of, I emailed them and asked them if we could do Antarctica themed ice creams. <laughs> and what they did was like, he loved the idea. Um, so he kind of came up with these flavor profiles for the, the Antarctic iceberg and the penguin. <laughs> and I actually got to sample some, this, this hasn't been done yet, but it's in the mm -hmm. process. Um, it was incredibly delicious, but along with the ice cream. So when you buy both pints of ice cream, you'll get a postcard with it. And this is a postcard of some of my images, some of which I just just uh, showed you. Um, so you get this postcard with your ice cream and you could actually mail out the postcard or or keep it put on your fridge or something. But it's a pretty it's good idea. A, a fun way, yeah, for me to continue telling the story, continue reliving this, this special, Experience. special time. We also try to team up with the Indianapolis Zoo here so because they have a Gen 2 penguin exhibit. So we wanted to, to highlight them as well. And we might do a video, a video and stuff as well for, for that. That's awesome. But that really brings me to the end of the presentation. I have my contact information up there again, uh, my Instagram, uh, also Kevin Raber's Instagram if you're uh, interested in, in his workshops and things like that. But mm -hmm. That kind of brings me to the end. Yeah, well, and thanks, Michael, for a wonderful presentation. Those were some amazing pictures. And before we wrap this up, uh, I want to go through some of the questions that our attendees sent us well in advance and also during this webinar. Sure. And let's start with the first one by Mark Kittner. Uh, he will be traveling with us next year, so <laughs> he's counting on that one. <laughs> he wants to pick your brain uh, on bringing a 500 millimeter versus 300 millimeter lenses. Is 500 too unwieldy, he asked. I would say from my um, perspective, 500 would be too much, too long. Mm -hmm. uh, I like those zoom lenses. So I had the 70 to 200, as I mentioned, uh, but that 100 to 400, I think would be the, the kind of the perfect amount of, of zoom. Because you do want to have the ability to not be locked into a very specific focal length, mm -hmm. so having the ability to kind of zoom uh, for me was was really great because you can kind of get those wider shots and then zoom in to get some of the details, and you could do it super fast. Like you don't have to worry about changing lenses, and also you're you are constantly kind of moving. So when you have that really long focal length, you know, keeping it steady and 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 whatnot could be very difficult. Yeah, it takes a toll. All right then. So the second one to mix it up a little bit with the questions that came in through today, um, this one's from Deborah Boddicker and you know, she says, thanks, great to see your pics. Mm -hmm. And if it's possible to share more, more details about which lenses you use when and what settings you use, do sure. you use any of the preset modes or always in 100% manual? How about dealing in low gray light? For the most part, I probably shot in manual for the most part. Uh, sometimes with the wildlife situations, I'll switch to either like an auto ISO um, or a kind of an aperture priority mode. Uh, just, or, you know, so I'm shooting fast enough to capture the wildlife. But if, you know, if something goes into a shadow or something like that, uh, your camera's going to adjust appropriately and you're not going to be able to have to do that manual adjustment. Mm -hmm. But with the, a lot of the landscapes and stuff, I was just on full manual. Um, I, I had with me, and again, I was doing video as well. So I probably would have had... Um, a second camera body that I used for stills and I just would have kept a 24 to 70 on one and ideally I think a 100 to 400 on the other. Uh, I had a 70 to 200 as I mentioned a few times but you could see what I was able to capture with the 70 to 200 for the most part and uh, it certainly did, did not disappoint me um, but being able to get a little tighter on some of the things I actually was one of the guys on our workshop had a 100 to 400 and 
I was like, oh, I wish I was able to get a little bit closer because <laughs> I was always a little jealous of some of the shots that he had. But uh, I did have a 16 to 35 lens as well. And uh, mm-hmm. I, think I took like two or three shots with it. Um, I, but again, I, I like to shoot tight. I like to get in on the textures and the details. If you're a wide angle shooter, maybe having that 16 to 35 and then a longer zoom lens would be, would be good as well. So. All right. That's a good one. So another one that we got uh, was, um, this one's anonymous. It says, does the 821 team help you know the best spots to photograph while you're there? I'm guessing they're referring to, you know, if there's, any, if there's yeah. anyone involved with photography in every trip. I, I mean, from my perspective, everything is, is <laughs> If there is daylight out, you would be shooting, uh, or you could be shooting. Even like when you're just traveling through the water, uh, you know, passing some icebergs or going through the channels. There are times when you get out a little bit further away from the land, you know, you could take some breaths, <laughs> but, uh, or move, move your hand from the trigger position. But what I found is that the, the crew and, and everyone, uh, they also do presentations uh, on, the, on the trip. And that's during those times when you're kind of in transit a little bit further away from things that, to capture. Um, but they are going to let you know for sure when things are happening or if there's wildlife out almost to the point where you might be exhausted (laughs) where you'll just be like, Oh my God, I got to go back to my room, get my camera and get out there. Cause things could, you know, pop up uh, and that are unpredictable and you might get that moment and you're in the right place at the right time. I think I had my camera at my side pretty much the whole time um, just to try to be prepared. Um, And again, like I said, at night when it's getting darker, if you have a camera that will shoot, you know, at higher ISOs, you know, that's when you kind of get into the higher level cameras. Um, but there wasn't a ton of moments that I felt like, you know, I, I was in that scenario where I, I was like, oh, I wish I had, you know, something that would shoot in a really dark situation because mm-hmm. you'll see it during the day for sure. So. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. And we have one question that I think relates to what you were saying about the tripod. And it goes like, um, you mentioned the 100 to 400 lens. I have a 200 to 500 Nikon as well as a 150, 600 Tamron. The concern I have is weight. I use a monopod, not a tripod, unless I am in fixed locations, usually for stability as well as to handle the weight. I use a Nikon D810 with external motor. In the Zodiac, how easy can I use a monopod or should I concentrate on the 7200 F2.8? That's a very technical question. (laughs) <laughs> it was for me i like i had that little tripod with me which also kind of converts into a monopod mm-hmm. and on the zodiac especially when you have when it's a full zodiac it's almost impossible to set up to set up even for the weight but what they will allow you to do is like in some scenarios you can actually get like sit on the floor of the zodiac and mm-hmm. rest your camera on like the edge of the zodiac so you can kind of rest that big lens on the front uh, on the side of the boat but as far as like opening up the monopod and like holding it, it's, it's going to be really hard to do that, especially because you have to kind of navigate around people. So, you know, you got five people basically on each side of the Zodiac. So if you're shooting out one way, that Zodiac will eventually turn around so that the other people get kind of a, a good view of what's going on as well. So it's, everything is constantly, you know, moving. So if you can limit what you're, what you have to hold down, uh, that would certainly help, help for sure. <laughs> Good to know. And well, going back to the use of your uh, your phone, you did mention that you brought your your iPhone, your, your iPhone eight plus, and you use it a lot. Mm-hmm. And you know, a lot of people nowadays they just bring their phone for their trips. Um, and this person wants to know what photography apps do you use the most? I use I kind of have a number of go to ones. The Tintype app was just a, a fun one because I knew I wanted to capture everyone with that kind of look mm-hmm. uh, i use camera plus which is a uh, an app um i think it's both on google uh, and and uh, ios mm-hmm. so i use that as my main camera app for the most part and for a couple reasons i just like some of the features that it has it has a little bit more manual control it has like a macro feature which i like to use a lot but the actual iphone app camera is a great camera as well i use that primarily exactly. for uh, panos which i try to do in each location like i 
you know, just slide my camera out of my top pocket and do a pano just to kind of showcase that whole landscape. And then I use my main camera to kind of focus in on some of those, those details and, you know, maybe even do some, some wider shots and things like that. So. I was actually surprised that those, uh, some of those, um, you know, uh, pictures were done with a cell phone. Yeah. Really yeah, for sure. Good. Especially like if you don't plan to, to print something really large um, and you just want to do some social media posts, like your phone is going to be a great tool to have exactly. um, for that type of stuff for sure. You see, sure. I used it, used it a lot. I use, I probably use it today as my primary camera for the most part, like when I'm with family. And things. Awesome. And now relating to, you know, to the weather, um, someone's asking that I understand the call affects the longevity of batteries. Mm. Should I bring a certain type of battery? My camera uses four double A type batteries, which on a normal trip would last me three to four days. So most of the cameras that I've had, even the smaller ones have those rechargeable lithium batteries. Mm -hmm. I had the grip on my Canon and the Sony. So it's actually holding two batteries. I never had an issue with batteries. Um, now, granted, I was there at a warmer time of year, so I was never hit with extreme cold. Um, obviously, as it gets colder, your batteries have less of less life as they as you're in those colder colder climates. So, having something like hand warmers, keeping your batteries like close to your chest in a chest pocket, anything to keep them warmer uh, will help help with that longevity. But also what I did is I had made sure I had enough batteries so that when I was out on the Zodiac, because you're only out on the Zodiac for maybe four hours at the most. So, and you always have like kind of a break and then you come back and you go out again later. So if you always are charging a set of batteries <laughs> and just kind of get yourself into that like habit of just throw them on the charger when you get back and then they'll be fresh for the next time. And then when you go to bed, you know, charge up the other ones and just keep it on that cycle. I actually packed a power strip with me. So I was, cause I didn't know how much access I'd have to like power. So I had my, my power strip and I had anywhere from like three to four different types of batteries, chargers, charging at all times. So, but keeping that cycle definitely helped me for sure. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And well, kind of in the same direction, and someone's asking, you know, for those photo art enthusiasts, my camera can take a 128 gigabyte memory card, which I understand can take 35,000 35, plus photos. How many SD cards do you recommend I take? So when it comes to SD cards, I found that, so I have my camera shoots to two SD cards at the same time. So I always try to think of, you know, replicating my images throughout the whole trip. So, you know, I, I typically had a 64 gig card, uh, two 64 gig cards so that they're shooting the same images to, to each one of the cards. Um, so I prefer in a lot of cases to have a few smaller ones rather than one big one, because mm -hmm. if you lose or that one big one, something happens to it, then you've kind of lost all of your images <laughs> from the trip, which is not, not something you, you want to have happen. Yeah. Um, so when I got back to the room, I also did, you know, I would back up you know, my, my camera or my SD cards to an external hard drive and also to my computer. And I tried to keep it so that I didn't have to actually format any cards during the trip either. So yeah. I basically had three copies of everything in some cases, four copies, <laughs> uh, of everything that I had captured throughout the whole, whole trip. Um, so that being being like something to keep in mind is to kind of replicate your images, keep them separated. But as, as you know, like with more cards, they can sometimes become harder to keep track of. So kind of giving yourself a little system of organization on, you know, what cards you've used mm -hmm. and uh, how much space you have. Like that's, that's really what it's all about. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. All right. And we'll do a couple more before uh, finishing for today. Um, and Shelly Hartnett, she's asking if, do you suggest mirror versus mirrorless if only one camera is to be used? Um, so I had both with me. I, my Canon 5D Mark IV, you know, it's a DSLR. Um, I mean, the thing has been a workhorse for me. It's just like a beast of a camera. I've never had any issues with it. I knew it would be strong in the scenarios that I'd be in. 
Mm-hmm. But the Sony, this A7 III is Sony's, one of their newer mirrorless cameras. And that too, it held up perfectly. I did all my video with that and never had any issues with it. Um, so it really depends on what you're comfortable shooting with. I think you don't want to get into a scenario where you're trying out a new camera for the first time on this trip. <laughs> um, Cause if you have, you know, if, if you rent a camera or you have something that you're not, you're not really familiar with, you're going to end up maybe getting frustrated, um, you know, when you're shooting, cause you're going to be trying to adjust and figure things out when everything is already going to be moving so, so quickly, and so fast. So, um, that's why I had my Canon with me and, and it worked out great. Cause I know how to use that thing, you know, <laughs> with, without even looking through the viewfinder. So it was, uh, it was, that was probably what I would recommend. There's no one that I would recommend more, I guess, over the other, they, they both shoot incredible images. Uh, it's just more about your comfort shooting with those because that's what's really capturing the images. The, the, the camera is just a tool, so you have to be able to use that tool. <laughs> All right. And last question before we go on and announce the winner of today's gift card uh, is, can you recommend a good dry waterproof camera bag or regular bag I could use to protect my camera from the wet and condensation? Yeah, the camera, so the camera bag that I had was, De- it was called Dekine, and mm-hmm. it was, uh, it's a water resistant bag, but also had one of those like kind of rain fly shields that you could pull out and zip over, uh, over the bag. Again, the weather that we had was never, like it never even really snowed heavily on us. We had a day of like some mist and whatnot, but I never got like really wet. Um, um, in that first Zodiac trip from the shoreline to the boat is when we hit some like big waves and stuff, <laughs> which was really fun. <laughs> but that was th- that moment when I was traveling across there, that's when I actually zipped my camera up and, and put the rain fly on it and stuff. And I, I never got anything wet or anything like that. And like I said before, y- you have breaks in between so that you can kind of clean things off and make sure things are dry. Um, so there's no one particular bag that I would recommend over another one. Um, I I would go with a smaller bag that, you know, would fit all the things that you'd likely have just to keep everything a little bit lighter and and more snug. It's going to make you more comfortable. I thought my camera bag that I had is kind of like one of those bigger like hiking bags almost, uh, which became a little too large at times (laughs) to walk around. So. All right, then. Well, Why don't you go ahead, Michael, and announce uh, who's receiving today's uh, Amazon gift card? Sure. Let me take a look here at the chat. Uh, We have Gordon Jacobs is our winner of the... uh, Awesome, Gordon. Congrats, man. (laughs) Maybe a little suggestion of what uh, he can get with that gift card to, you know, to prepare for his Antarctic trip. Yes. Yeah, it'll be awesome for sure. All right. Well, with that out of the way, Michael, I just want to thank you for, you know, sharing your experience with us, your expertise, and, you sure. know, answering all these questions as well uh, from people interested. Yeah. I really do enjoy, you know, hosting these webinars as they are very interesting, and I ended up learning a lot. I'm sure people um, that attended today uh, feel the same as well. So thank you also for joining us today, everyone. And remember that we will follow up with an email with the recorded webcast and the questions that we asked today and also the ones that we didn't get to. All right. So yeah. thanks again and for joining. If you wanted to say something, Michael, before. Oh, we... yeah. I just want to thank everyone that joined. And again, if you need anything or have questions, uh, Instagram is probably the easiest way to reach out to me. Um, and certainly we'll send out a link to the to YouTube video that I shot while I was there. So it'll really give you a, a good feel of what it was like for for our group there awesome all right so yeah that's again the information for if you want to contact michael and if you want to contact us and thanks everyone for joining i can see people you know sending some chats now all right well thanks everyone have a great day thanks so much goodbye